Hey everybody, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com answering the questions I get from all around the world. Before I get started, I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Becca Wall who is going to school at Ole Miss. Uh, Becca just made the women's softball team. I'm very excited for you and uh, uh, Becca was my assistant who helped me with probably 20 or 30 different libraries all over Texas uh, when I was doing my library tour. So Becca, good luck at baseball or softball. I'm sorry, don't get mad at me because I said baseball instead of softball. And um, I miss you and I'm looking forward to when you come back to Texas so we can uh, uh, maybe sneak away and go fishing, which would be incredibly fun. All right, let's get into it. Pedro from Aviero, Portugal says, hey DG. You said that Spinosaurus had the sail on its back to keep the body warm when it was in the water. So why do other dinosaurs like Suchomimus, Baryonyx, and Megaraptor, how come they didn't have that? I hope you understand my question. I do, Pedro, and it's a great question. First of all, it's nice to hear from you. Um, we don't know for certain whether or not uh, Megaraptor had that uh, had sails on their back because very little has been found of that dinosaur, and I don't know if the back vertebral column has been found so we could determine whether or not it had a sail. I, I cannot say for sure what that sail was for. Certainly that's one of the proposed ideas that it was used as a way to regulate body temperature, but I don't have any idea. Certainly it is the dinosaur's environment that determines what the dinosaur looks like. And perhaps if the sail was used as a way to radiate heat, or to lose it for that matter, it may have been that the environment where Spinosaurus lived may have been different than the environments where some of these other dinosaurs lived. And that may be why you see a bigger sail or a more pronounced sail on this guy. All right, uh, Brandon from Callahan, Florida says, hey George, I'm your biggest fan. <clears throat> Excuse me, Brandon, I got choked up. That's very kind of you, thank you, buddy. Uh, Brandon says, my question is, were Tyrannosaurs the most advanced predators that ever lived? Along with my favorite dinosaur, uh, he says, I'm sorry, although my favorite dinosaur is Ceratosaurus, I love Tyrannosaurus. Thanks, George. Well, Brandon, first of all, you're very welcome. Thank you for taking the time to write to me. I think Ceratosaurus is an incredibly cool looking dinosaur, so you have a very wicked uh, pick for your favorite. Tyrannosaurus were certainly advanced, uh, the, especially the later Tyrannosaurus. But in my opinion, I actually have more of a tendency to believe that the raptors, the dromaeosaurs, were even more advanced than the tyrannosaurs. I think based on the work that I've seen uh, Dr. Larry Whitmer do at Ohio University, where um, they're doing CAT scans of the brain, I think that uh, the, the, um, the raptors were even more advanced. Whatever the answer is, Brandon, I can tell you that certainly tyrannosaurs were truly the king of the hills at their time uh, because of their size, but also because they were they were certainly more advanced than a lot of the other dinosaurs that they lived with. All right, Martin from Chicago, Illinois says, hey DG, it's me again. Hey Martin, good to hear from you. Uh, did you get the news on the new humpback dinosaur called Concave <clears throat> Concavenator? Concavenator. I guess it's Concavenator. That makes more sense, huh? Uh, I was wondering if this could be synonymous with Beckel Spinax. In my, if so, my comic is going to have a big blow. <laughs> Martin writes comics, and if you've put Beckel Spinax in there, I think you're perfectly safe. Looking at what I know of Beckel Spinax, that odd hump was actually closer to its shoulders, whereas this new concavenator. <clears throat> You guys are gonna have to excuse me, my voice is almost gone. Uh, that one appears to have a, that, that raised hump closer to its hips. Uh, it is a freakishly looking dinosaur, very strange looking guy. Um, and from what I understand, there's a lot of information that we're going to get about this dinosaur because it was a, apparently preserved incredibly well. So uh, I think they would be distinctively two different dinosaurs because I think the hump moved. It's kind of like the hump on uh, Igor uh, on Young Frankenstein. <laughs> What hump? <laughs> it keeps moving. So I think you're you're perfectly fine. <clears throat> Excuse me, you guys. All right, uh, Michael from Cliffs Cliffside Park, New Jersey. Hey, DG. If most of the large sauropods were barely self-aware due to their small brains, then how did they know to swallow stones in order to help digest plant material? Wow, great observation. This is what I love about uh, paleontology, and what I really love about. Uh, having so many questions sent to me from you guys. You're really looking at things from different points of view, and I think that's exciting. Uh, brilliant question, Michael. Here's what I think. I think the brain works two different ways in animals. I think we have a thinking side of the brain, the one that makes us self-aware, and I think we have a reactionary part of the brain, the part that tells the body to do things 
regardless of how intelligent you are. Uh, even the lowest form of life, uh, in most cases, that would be uh, po politicians. <laughs> I'm sorry. Even the lowest forms of life have a brain that reacts to certain things. And I think that the reaction would be that the body knows that it's not getting enough nutrients out of the plant material. And therefore, the part of the brain that's reactionary would send a signal to the brain telling it you need to do this in order for us to survive. So I don't think it would be cognitive thinking where the dinosaur would think to itself, you know, I bet you if I swallowed stones, that would help digestion. I think the non-thinking, the reactionary part of the brain told the body to do that. It's as simple as um, uh, when we're little, if we were not taught to walk as babies, we would learn to walk because that part of the brain would teach us regardless of our abilities. So I think that that's kind of the message I guess I'm trying to say here, Michael, and I hope that makes sense to you. Even though you're correct, that brain is tiny, I think it was still there was enough of the reactionary side to make these dinosaurs very successful. And they were because they were around for millions of years. All right, finally, my buddy from Rodrigo, Monterey, Mexico. I love hearing from Rodrigo. He says, hey, George, it's your always Mexican best friend, Rodrigo, the 14-year-old paleontologist. <laughs> Rodrigo, I always enjoy hearing from you. Uh, he says, I hope you're fine. I am, buddy, and I hope you and your family are fine. He says, it's been almost a year since I sent you a question. Yeah, where have you been, Rodrigo? Uh, I guess you're probably sending questions. Maybe we're just not lucky enough for them to be chosen, but uh, it has been a while and I'm glad to hear from you. Uh, he says, last week, my sports teacher told me something about an article he read. It was about measuring the temperature of a dinosaur. And I said, what the heck? That's impossible. I'd like to know your opinion, George. Thank you, and I hope you can come uh, to Mr. Kenneth Carpenter's conference that will be held here in Saltillo, Cojila, Mexico. It's on September 25th at five o'clock. Thank you very much, George, and take care. All right, Rodrigo, let me tell you something. I have never had the opportunity and the privilege yet to meet Dr. Kenneth Carpenter, but I've had a couple of long phone calls with him. He is one of the most polite people in the industry. Uh, I would love to hear him. I probably will not be able to make it because of the short time, but I'll tell you this, my friend, I'll bet you you're in for an exciting um, uh, speech. The guy is, or lecture, the guy is very intelligent and I really like him a lot. So I wish I could go, but when you see him, please tell him I said hello. All right, to your question, measuring the temperature of a dinosaur. At this point, it's not possible to know for certain what their body temperatures were. That's just not possible. But there are ways that paleontologists have to look at the evidence to help get an idea of their body temperature. And based on all the evidence, it appears that they're probably more likely warm-blooded. Now, how warm that blood was is a question we may not know, or we do not know at this time, but we may never know. I just, that's going to be a hard one to know. Um, but we can look at things like their stride length. We can look at footprints and we can determine how fast we think they're walking. That alone gives us some insight into whether or not we're looking at an animal who is a, a sluggish, slow, cold-blooded lizard, or if it's, a, if it's more mammalian or bird-like, and their stride tells us that they're moving at a pretty fast rate, which suggests warm-bloodedness. There's a lot of other things we can look at, body growth rates that help determine uh, whether or not they're warm-blooded or not and might give us some insight into their uh, body temperatures. Uh, the other thing that's possible is we're finding more and more evidence uh, being given to us through CAT scan and through really well-preserved dinosaurs that are giving us even more insight into whether or not these things are warm-blooded or cold-blooded. But at the end of the day, with the technology we have right now, I cannot say with any certainty that we can know for sure what the body temperature was, but who knows? They're making so many advancements in this industry who knows what tomorrow will hold. All right, you guys, send me your questions at dinosaurgeorge.com. Make sure to fill out the form on the Ask Dinosaur George page. For all of you young people out there, I know I say this every time and some of you claim that you're bored of hearing it. I'm sorry, but I'm never gonna stop saying it. Make sure you young people to practice your reading because reading is important. And for everybody out there, continue to use those good manners because man, it sure makes the world a much better place. I'll see you all soon. Take care, everybody.